All right, so welcome. Welcome online. <clears throat> uh, can you hear me okay at home? Great. <laughs> so welcome. Um, this is our monthly sitting, uh, exploring mindfulness, uh, bringing secular mindfulness back into the Dharma, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, so my name is Tig for, I think I've met, uh, everyone. Um, I'm trained in secular meditation practices, um, at medical and research institutions. Uh, and I teach in hospitals and universities. I'm currently teaching for a research study at Brown University um, that's bringing together a lot of these Dharma-based practices um, with some psychoanalytic tools to support resiliency in the queer community. Um, so, and then that's kind of on the secular side and then on the sacred side, I am a practitioner of Tibetan Dharma. I also have a deep practice in Vipassana that I started as a child. So I've been kind of weaving together these kind of traditional Buddhist concepts with the evidence-based secular concepts. Uh, and that's really the, where this class came from of kind of exploring the best of both. And it's not to pit each other against, uh, pit them against each other. It's not to say that one is better than the other, um, but it is to acknowledge that um, in the West, mindfulness has been pulled away from the Dharma. And so this is kind of a way of bringing it back in. Um, we are at the San Francisco Dharma Collective community run organization. Um, I was just saying to Noam, uh, I was really enjoying the concert that was here on Friday night. Uh, it was just such a feeling of community. It was one of the first times that I really felt that uh, kind of coming together in, in the space, even though we've had sittings here, it just felt like while well, we're gathering for not just practice, but also kind of entertainment and music and um, so really loving the, the vibe of the Dharma Collective. Um, we are supported by Donna. Uh, so any donations go to teachers and keeping the lights on. And thankfully tonight, the heat. <laughs> it's a chilly night in San Francisco. Um, so any generosity that you can afford to offer the center and our teachers is greatly appreciated. Um, so for this is our third class in this uh, series, and the first one we talked about the definition of mindfulness and how in the sacred uh, traditions it complements the kind of um, secular definitions of paying attention to the present moment on purpose um, and without judgment. And then we explored uh, attachment. Um, so the craving and the um, clinging to things that feel good. I'm just going to pause for a second and ask about that. Okay, great, great. Great practice for aversion. <laughs> Hype, so if you can't hear it at home, there's a bit of a high-pitched noise in the space right now. Um, so anyway, we were talking last month about attachment and kind of looking at how um, the secular and sacred come together to um, hopefully potentially find a path towards a healthy attachment or secure attachment. Um, and so tonight we're going to be looking at it from the opposite side of aversion. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the Dharma um, and, and what the teachings are in terms of aversion, um, but also a lot around avoidance and how we teach that in the secular format, and then we'll kind of bring them together. So um, we're gonna start as always with a mindfulness practice. So we'll sit for about 20 minutes. Um, this is a practice that's called choiceless awareness. Um, and so a lot of times in mindfulness, we choose one anchor in our sensory experience and we focus a single point of concentration on that one anchor. Uh, mind wanders and we come back to that anchor, knowing that the mind wandering is actually the mechanism for us to strengthen the neural pathways in our brain to be present. So we want to embrace when the mind wanders away as an opportunity to practice bringing it back. With choiceless awareness, we'll start with an anchor, but then we will start like um, uh, eccentric, concentric circles expanding outward. So we'll start with sensations in the body and then we'll include sounds, we'll include thoughts 
And then we'll just rest in an open awareness, let the mind move as it will. So it might go from a sound to a thought to a feeling in the body. At certain times, we might be able to be with multiple senses. Um, so as always, just check it out, see what the practice is like, knowing that there's really no wrong way to practice. The, um, the right way to practice is already done, we're here. So uh, let's get ourselves set up for um, just under 20 minutes of practice. And so making that transition from the world of doing and striving and goals into a period of just being with an intention to be present and no striving or judgment here. So starting to create that space for yourself to practice in whether you'd like to close the eyes or perhaps soften the gaze down to a surface in front of you. And let's start just by noticing what's here. What, what energy are we carrying into this practice right now? And that might be an energy in the body maybe sleepy, tired, maybe feeling some energy. Checking in with the energy of the mind. Many of us had busy days today, moving around, thinking, talking. So what's the energy that we are bringing in our mind right now? And we're just checking in. We don't need to change or fix anything. No right way or wrong way of being right now, just noticing. And from here, perhaps you'd like to set an intention for your practice or our time together in class, a way of being, an attitude that you'd like to embody. Maybe that's to be present, to be open. Many of us have taken teachings on aversion in the past, so maybe bringing a beginner's mind. And just allowing that energy to kind of point the ship in the direction that we want to go. Attuning ourselves to that aspiration. And then as we start to transition into the main part of this practice, letting go of that cognition and allowing the awareness to drop down into the body, perhaps feeling the contact of the chair, or the floor, Perhaps sensation of pressure or firmness where we are making contact. And just staying here for a few more moments, exploring, being curious of what it's like to be seated right now what it's like to be resting on the ground. And keeping part of the attention anchored in those sensations. And the other part of the attention beginning to broaden the awareness to include the legs. Noticing any sensations here in the legs, a pulsing, a tingling, contact with fabric. And then widening now to include the legs and the feet and also the torso.
and now including the arms. And you might be scanning for specific sensations, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, or maybe it's just an awareness of the body. Now including the neck and the head, but just resting for a moment in the entire somatic field of the body. Perhaps noticing times when the attention focuses, narrows into a particular sensation, maybe the contact or another sensory experience happening in the body. And then zooming out. So perhaps noticing this narrowing and then opening of the awareness. Concentrating and then expanding. Perhaps you'd like to bring your awareness to the breath and include that sensation, that awareness with the entire body. So what is it like to hold the awareness with the complete vessel of the body and also notice the breath? And noticing times of the narrowing and then expanding of the awareness, and also times where the mind may move away from the body, get lost in thoughts or other experiences that are happening. And just an offering to remember that that mind wandering is not a problem in this practice. We just notice and gently return back to the awareness of the body the symphony of sensations happening with inside it, the contact of the chair, the sensations of breath. And then broadening once again to include sounds. So keeping an awareness of the body, perhaps the breath, perhaps the contact, and notice the sounds in the environment you're in. And sometimes this may feel confusing, not sure where to place your attention. Just letting the mind move between sensations in the body, the breath, the sounds. We're not directing the mind in any one area. Just allowing this choiceless awareness, the body of sounds, and now let's include thoughts in that field of awareness. It can be helpful to think of the awareness as an expanding bubble, incorporating everything that's happening inside that field Just being here and noticing without directing, just an open spacious awareness to all that's unfolding in this moment.
if the attention does narrow on one aspect of the experience that's not wrong or bad just noticing that that's what's happening and perhaps inviting that broadening once again opening up expanding that bubble to include everything that you're noticing in this moment Perhaps even considering dropping the idea that you're meditating right now, because that's doing. And so just being here. If at any point this becomes confusing or disorienting, you're certainly welcome to come to the breath or the sensation of the ground beneath the body to anchor your mind. And then when you're feeling ready, you can return back to this practice of choiceless awareness, expanding the attention, incorporating all of the senses, the way that we're responding to the present moment included. And so we'll practice in this way for the remainder of this formal meditation, resting in silence, just being with this choiceless awareness.
and just taking a moment to check in. Where is the mind? Where is the attention? And there's no wrong answer. Just being curious where you find the mind right now. And if it is concentrated on a particular sense, perhaps inviting that broadening, that expansion of the awareness to include the body, the breath, sounds, thoughts. Even the mind wandering away is part of this practice. We just notice that it's drifting into a particular thought and we don't do anything about it. We just watch that. And then maybe it will lead to another thought or an emotion, a sensation in the body, and then a thought. Just leaning back in the mind and being the observer And just for a moment, an invitation to gather up all the attention and come to the sense of sound as you hear these words by poet Donna Folds. There is no controlling life. Try corralling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild and the weak, fear, fantasies, failures, and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness veils your vision with despair, practice becomes simply bearing the truth. In letting go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to your new eyes. So let's rest together for a few more moments in practice, bearing the truth of this moment, allowing, being with this practice. And before we come to an end of the practice, let's just take a moment to check in again. Notice any shifts in the mind or the body. What energy is here now?
perhaps that practice was calming and grounding. And for some of us, it may have been irritating and annoying, it may have agitated us. Simply bearing the truth of what's here now. And then if you'd like to join me in following one more breath into the body. And on the exhale, letting go of the air, releasing that practice, taking time to return back to open eyes if you had them closed and inviting any movement or stretches that would feel good to help make this transition into the next part of our class. Mm. <clears throat> I see gallery view on that. Is that possible or no? Okay. Um, so I'm just curious if anyone wants to share what that practice may have been like, what you noticed, uh, what came up for you as we were practicing that choiceless awareness. And if you're online, you can just go ahead and mute yourself. What did you notice? And what I really think is that she was not the one who was seeing things that I wasn't really interested in noting my attention and interest. And uh, that other really was a problem. I'm thinking I'm also tired of this, but it's a very different class of the practice. Mm. Without being interested in the practice. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. Did you all hear, could you hear that online? No. Okay. So Noam was just describing that um, I pra he practices that often um, and many times it's more of like an applied practice, like riding a bike or something like that, or just kind of noticing. Um, and he was reporting that tonight he's feeling a little sleepy and tired, but that practice felt restful. Any thoughts on why that is? Can you hear me? I hold this closer. Okay. It's okay. I can, I'll try, I'll interpret. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't noting that I wasn't Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times in the open with that spacious awareness, there's a feeling of like not having to control or direct, it's just open. So a lot of times it might feel like a single point of concentration might feel like work. Like, I, you know, these Ryan Redmond calls it the meditation scars of like really focusing. <laughs> Mine are pretty deep. <laughs> uh, but in this practice, it's not that. It's just this kind of like spaciousness rather than this focus. And so I can see how that could feel very restful. And it would be interesting also to play around with that noting or not noting in a, a standard mindfulness practice. Just see what that's like. Check it out. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. No.
Anyone else? It doesn't seem like it's working. Can you hear me now? No, it's not going to be Yeah, that's fine. Well, so one time actually we were having, after the morning, so we were having a conversation about sleeping, and you were a part of it. And I, and I was, I hope you don't mind me saying what you had said, which was like, you took a stand, but sleeping is not meditating. So, anyways, um, but occasionally, and it happened to me tonight. I started to dream, I was dreaming, but like my head was not, I was like in my, in my boat and I was, I kept coming in and out of that. And I actually sort of similarly found it very, the, the meditation to be very restful and pleasurable. Mm. And so there was a moment where it, it just occurred to me that I don't know if it's dreaming, maybe it's a vision, I don't know. But it was but it was pleasurable mm. the whole experience. Mm. Mm. Uh Daniel? Yeah. So Daniel was just describing um an experience, uh, something that someone had said before about sleeping is uh, sleeping is not meditating. So the kind of the difference there. Um, but uh, he was describing um, the same quality of restfulness. Um, there was kind of a almost it sounds like a lucid kind of drifting into dreaming, but not really sleeping. Still be able to maintain the posture. Were you aware of the dream? Were you aware that you were dreaming? No. You're in it. And then what would happen when you notice that? I think I think I would feel calm when I just allowed it to happen. Allow. That's the name of that poem that I read. <laughs> Allow. <laughs> so Daniel was describing that when um, he noticed that the uh, the dreaming was happening, um, it wasn't. It didn't seem to be a problem. It wasn't problematic. It's a little bit of questioning, like questioning. Oh, shoot, am I just nodding off? Mm -hmm. Right. Know? Yeah. Okay. Investigating, checking it out. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, you know, it's it's the it's still a mental formation. Right. So even if we are dreaming, uh, if we're not in our, if we're not in REM sleep, it's a mental formation. And so that's just something that we notice. It's very similar to how the mind might wander. And the reason I was asking what it was like when you notice that is because whether we do actually fall asleep in a practice or we start lucid dreaming, whatever it is, the moment that we notice it and we have the choice of what to do. Are we going to feel bad about it? Are we going to let it go, allow it to be there? Are we going to return back to the practice? How are we going to return back to the practice? This is all what you know we know from science that's engaging the prefrontal cortex. How we handle the mind wandering or drifting into a dream state or drifting into sleep is what strengthens the neural pathways um, so that we can do the same thing in life. When stress happens, we open up space for choice. How are we going to respond to this? So great practice. So that practice, I think, you know, is one, it's great to have single point of concentration. It's great to focus. Um, we know that that really helps build the kind of the gray matter in the brain. And that very spacious, open awareness. We're going to talk a little bit about it as we move into the teaching, um, but it's that spaciousness that really helps provide a broad perspective. So when difficult things do happen, we're not fixated on them or that, like, you know, the blinders don't come on as much, you know, maybe they're more like this. <laughs> um, so Check out that choiceless awareness practice. As no mentioned, it's something that you can also do very easily when you're out and about, you know, when you're in a meeting or you're walking down the street and just broadening the awareness to include all of the senses or as many that are coming forward and not really directing the mind in one way. 
So thank you for sharing. So tonight we're gonna to talk about aversion and avoidance, which means that um, in order to kind of deal with these topics, we have to acknowledge that there is discomfort. You know, we wanna be averting our attention away from something or we wanna be avoiding something. And so this is our first noble truth uh, that there is suffering. There are difficult things that happen in life. This is part of, this is part of the game. And so what I want to start our kind of explore of this just with a very brief uh, reflection. So this will just be a couple minutes. You can stay seated exactly as you are. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes, maybe just soften them a bit, lower them down. And if it feels comfortable, I'd like you, I'd like to invite you to call to mind something difficult that's recently happened. Maybe not the hardest thing, maybe not something that's gonna trigger really powerful emotions right now, but just something uncomfortable or unpleasant that has happened or maybe even is happening right now. This could be a certain event or a situation. It could be a relationship or a difficult person at work. Just taking a moment to call to mind this unpleasant experience. Maybe taking a moment to visualize, watching it happen. And just notice what starts arising as you hold this difficulty in the mind's eye. Maybe there's a feeling in the body that's arising. Or if it's something that happened in the past, just checking in with what that might have felt like in that moment. So noticing how the body is responding. And checking in with the mind. What's the story here? How are we interpreting what's happening? And just sitting for another moment being curious of what's coming up in body and mind, how the thoughts may lead to other sensations in the body, how emotions may start arising. And either that's happening now in this practice or it's a memory of something that happened before. How did you respond? What did it feel like? And what were the stories, the thoughts that were unfolding in that moment? And then taking a moment to release your awareness from that memory or that experience, maybe checking in with the breath or the feeling of the ground beneath the body just to stabilize yourself. And then as we come to an end of that reflection, returning back to open eyes if they were closed. So I'd love to hear if anyone's up to share kind of what came up, what was that like? You don't have to necessarily give specifics about the experience or about what it was, but just what was your experience of it?
maybe it's even sitting in awkward silence. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, yeah. Gnome's describing a, no, a numbness in uh, his torso. And then what happens? Because I was just trying to feel it. You started thinking about it. And were there some some thoughts behind it? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely version. Mm -hmm. and, and there's, there's for me, in my opinion, life, there's like a it's, it's a way of distracting. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. it's, 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 like, the pain is the distraction. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So kind of di diverting the attention. Yeah, so no one was just describing that there's first this experience of numbness, this felt experience in the body. And then uh, he was reporting that it then became cerebral. He started thinking about it, um, but also in a way of potentially distracting self, oneself from feeling it. Did I get that right? I think that the numbness is actually a distraction. The numbness itself is a distraction. Yeah. yeah. I create numbness. Mm. So almost a coping mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Because <laughs> for me, I I feel like I feel the pain sort of like pressure, a very uncomfortable pressure in my chest. Uh huh. So an uncomfortable pressure here. Yeah. Uh huh. And and it, it's something that happened actually today that was actually. It was difficult, but I was able to process it with someone. So mm. you know, enough space of, you know, that that's what I was working with. And I was able to see some of the story that for me had to do with the story of people being out to get me, the mm. person was sort of out to get me, and I was a victim of the situation. And that I could see the way that I felt kind of um, very alone and a little bit um, like a little bit trapped mm. even though I wasn't. Mm -hmm. It felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So Daniel was just describing what started as a uncomfortable feeling in the chest, then kind of led to some narrative, some story around it, around being alone and um, you mentioned that you were able to process it with someone and, um, was that after the, you know, yeah. So you went through that experience and then kind of reached out and yeah. <clears throat> Anything else coming up for anyone? Was it sounding familiar or different from anyone? How about anyone at home? Anything you want to share? I think these are very common. Um, examples of where kind of what Noam was describing of this desire to kind of a, a, a coping mechanism. Um, and then what Daniel was sharing is kind of noticing that it wasn't just the sensation, but it was also how what happened in the mind um, that came after that sensation. So in the secular programs, we call these unpleasant events, <laughs> which is basically just a secular word for suffering. <laughs> Uh, and so what we do for an entire week is that we ask people to notice unpleasant events throughout their day. So every day to journal about one thing that happened, 
how it felt in the body, what came up in the mind, and then what happened. Did we try and push it away? Did we have an avoidant coping mechanism in play? Um, did we have a destructive outcome or a constructive outcome where we talked and processed with, with someone? And so it's really just about getting to know first, it's about getting to know what's happening. So we can't just push it away. So we have to learn how to be with it. One of my teachers calls it feel it to heal it, right? Like if we, if we push it away and we numb right away, then we actually lose the opportunity to learn from it or understand how it might reveal a narrative or a story that we have about ourselves or about what's going on. Um, and so it's really important to say, like through this entire teaching, is that we're not trying to bypass anything. In fact, we're doing the exact opposite. We're turning towards what's uncomfortable and learning how to be with it. So in a lot of different secular models, um, we look at the trigger or the event that happened. And then the next thing that happens is either simultaneously or one followed by the other of a response in the central nervous system that uh, is responding to some sort of perceived threat and then the um, psychological reactivity to that. So sometimes those happen at the same time, we feel something in the body at the same time a story is happening. And other times there's a feeling in the body that the story arises from. So there's like an interpretation of what's going on. So in the emotional balance course that I teach that I know some of you are familiar with like kind of the way that an emotional episode unfolds, we have the trigger and then after that, we have the response in the mind and then the response in the body that then dictates the state of our, how we react to it. Is it a destructive or a constructive result? And I wanted to share this, um, this graphic is a representation that um, we're using in this research study that I was describing. Um, this is a... a research study that's on queer stress. And so here you'll see minority stress trigger at the top. It can be any trigger. It can be something that someone says. It can be you know something that we see on the news. Um, and then we have the activation in the sympathetic nervous system happening at the same time as the interpretation of the situation. So we have the trigger, and then we have the nervous system's response and the interpretation of it, which those come together and create an even more increased sense of threat when that happens, what kicks in is this desire to reduce the suffering, right? So some, some may call that compassion, right? We have this compassionate response of, I need this to end. I need this to stop. Sometimes when we're watching someone else go through this process, our compassion kicks in because we want to reduce that suffering for them. But generally what happens is that if we're not practiced and we're not noticing, we're not staying with the experience is that we go from that desire to reduce suffering to an avoidance driven coping mechanism that might be what you know we heard the numbing or um you know you name it there could be a lot of different things i don't want to think about this anymore i'm going to avoid the situation i don't want to talk to this person i'm going to go um numb myself in a lot of different ways that we can do that and then that leads to this last part which is the belief in stories about myself so, uh, you know, we heard some of the narratives that were coming up around um, I'm alone in this or I, you know, other examples are that I'm not good at communication because this person, this person is triggering me, I can't handle this or I'm not worthy or uh, I'm not skilled at handling this. And so this entire loop, this entire process then turns into a loop because then this belief and story about ourselves then starts triggering more reactivity in the nervous system and the interpretation in the mind. So this really just shows kind of a uh, secular model of how difficulty kind of unfolds. It starts in the body and the mind, and then it just starts looping. And those two things start informing each other and it starts getting stronger and stronger. And in the other model, it leads to destructive result. And in this model, it leads to this avoidance driven coping. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Sometimes it could be a thought that then triggers a feeling in the body. Sometimes it might be a body that then triggers the thought. And sometimes they might happen simultaneously, that the thought and the narrative might arrive at the same time. That for me, that's what happens. My heart starts beating really fast when I get triggered. And then at the same time that I'm interpreting the situation through a different lens. It, it's different by person and it's also different by example. You know, if it's something that's relatively mild, it might actually be an interpretation before any kind of response in the body happens. If it's something that there's an immediate threat and our fight or flight kicks in right away, we might not even be having cognition about it. We might already be responding in the body before we even know what's happening in our mind. So uh, in these models, what is the antidote? So mindfulness and self-compassion. So when we teach the habit loop, and we're going to do, we're going to end our, our evening tonight with some self-compassion, is that right here, so if you can see my cursor moving, this kind of like this line from where that um, the activation in the sympathetic nervous system and the interpretation of the situation, this is where mindfulness comes in. Why do we do body scans? You know, you hear me joke a lot of times about like, why do we spend time in our big toe? Like, how is that helping us with stress? Because we're strengthening the neural connections in our brain to notice what's happening in the body. In the practice, we're doing it in our toes uh, or the feeling of the seat of the ground beneath us. But in real life, it's the same neural networks that are firing that help us with interoception, the ability to feel what's happening in the body. So we're not completely overtaken with it. So mindfulness, it might not stop it, but it at least allows us to be with it. And then with the interpretation of the situation, why do we notice our thoughts? Why do we notice the mind wandering in practice? Why do we practice watching our thoughts? Because when we meet stress, that same mechanism kicks in where we start interpreting what's happening. So the more that we practice mindfulness of our mental formations, the stronger that that network is to serve us when something like this happens. Am I seeing this clearly? Is that really what happened? Or, oh, wow, my mind is really, you know, it's pointing fingers, it's blaming, it's accusing. Uh, so we have a sharper sense of what's happening in mind and body through our mindfulness practice. And then the compassion. So the self-compassion, what do I need? How do I need to nurture myself? If there's a response in the body, do I need to change my posture? Do I need a drink of water? Do I need to take a deep breath? Do I need to take a pause and leave the situation? And then the self-compassion for the mental formations. It makes sense that I'm thinking this. It totally makes sense that I'm a, a perceiving this threat that's happening in front of me and that I'm interpreting, interpreting it in a way that's trying to um, reduce it. So it's a combination of mindfulness and self-compassion that can either help cut some of these cords or at least soften them, um, maybe even interrupting so it doesn't start cycling into looping. So the best way that we know to interrupt what's happening here in this kind of like chain reaction of thoughts and emotions, and then the emotions go to feelings in the body that then we have more thoughts and it just starts becoming this cycle. The way to interrupt that is actually just by feeling it, right? So if we just stay with the sensation, even if it's unpleasant, we're interrupting this looping, we're interrupting this kind of spiraling that starts happening just by staying with the sensation. Mind goes back up into interpretation of the situation and we come back down into the sensation. So this is kind of demonstrating where these practices or how these practices that we're doing tonight can serve us uh, along the way. So I wanna talk for a second, that's kind of the secular model. And so I wanna talk for a second about the Dharma and kind of what aversion means in the Dharma. So <clears throat> we have the three afflictions. We have um, confusion or ignorance. So we're not seeing clearly. We have attachment and craving. So if something feels good, we want more of it. And then we have aversion. So something that is unpleasant and we push it away. And so this is the, the second noble truth, you know? So this is the root of suffering, that it's our response to what's happening. It's never about the thing that's happening. It's our response to it. Once we leave that trigger and we go down into the reactivity and the body and the mind, 
the trigger is no longer the thing that caused the trigger is no longer the problem. It's how we're responding to it. And that is within our control. We can never control what's happening around us for the most part. Very, yeah. Uh, but we cannot respond. So the teaching around the difference between pain and suffering, pain, we cannot stop. But suffering is something that we can work with. And it was illustrated in that um, habit loop. Um, and so the uh, this pushing and pulling, as it's you know called in the Dharma, this clinging um, and grasping at things that feel good, and then the pushing away and avoiding things that feel bad. I, I It's this like I do it with my body, you know, it's like, we're just like pulling things in and pushing things away. And what's happening to my body right now? I'm not centered. I'm not still, I'm not grounded. I can't make a skillful response because my whole body is just moving around, trying to feel better and trying to avoid what doesn't feel good. And so the reason why I wanted to bring this kind of merging of the secular approach with the Buddhist approach to this <clears throat> is because the the teachings on aversion is that that leads to it's considered the seed of hate the seed of anger the seed of fear so a lot of our afflictive emotions our destructive response to emotions come from the inability to be uncomfortable it comes from this pushing away so it's not just simply about that nice graphic that shows how we can interrupt it we're not just interrupting it for the sake of feeling better we're interrupting it so it doesn't turn into hate, that this thing that's causing us to react in mind and body doesn't become demonized, um, that it becomes more an opportunity to practice compassion for ourselves, compassion for the person that's pissing us off. These are not things that happen in the moment. They're things that have to be cultivated and developed. But I think what is beautiful about this secular model, this kind of science-based model, is that it makes something really tangible. Like, how do we work with this? And how do the practices that we're doing support us in working with it? But then when we bring it into the Dharma aspect of that, it's not just for the benefit of ourself. It's also for the benefit of all those around us. So if we want to live in a world that's free of hate and ignorance and, and discrimination, then we have to practice that ourselves. We have to see how avoiding this discomfort by pushing it away is actually the seeds of bigger problems. And it might seem, you know, like a jump to go from a difficult conversation with someone to discrimination, but it's the same neural pathway. You know, a lot of times I've been noticing when I say, what did I, I said, um, I was teaching the other day and I said, we were about to do a role play uh, in dyads, you know, where people had to like practice mindful communication. And I said, I hate role play. And I, it just came out when I said it. And I was like that, even though it seems mild and, you know, like harmless enough that I said it, because I'm talking about a mindfulness practice. That is the same neural connection that's firing in my brain that will lead me to hate another person. It's a seed. And so the more that I water that by allowing it to be there or pushing it away and not confronting it, like, why did I say that? Why am I so uncomfortable with role play? Um, why did I say that in the class? And just exploring that, it helps not just cut the cord of reactivity, but it also cuts the seed of that of that hate and that ignorance that, that the Buddha was teaching us about. So how do we practice this from a Dharma perspective? Because we talked about how secular mindfulness and self-compassion uh, help us with the, the habit loop and the avoidance there. But when we talk about the practice from a Dharma, from, a, from the teachings perspective, we think about Vipassana. So the whole idea of sitting in practice and noticing things that are pleasant, things that are unpleasant in the practice as a way of uh, building our resiliency and our skills on how to deal with that in life. So if we're sitting in practice and we start feeling pain in the body and we immediately go to fix it or change it rather than spending some time with it, ah, how does this feel? Noticing the story that comes up. You know, for me, I have, I experience a lot of pain in my legs when I sit on the floor. And so that leads to a story in my mind about past injuries that I haven't healed from. And then, and then I start looping. And so if we can just be with the pain, if we can just notice all the things that start arising when 
all these uh, narratives that we may have or stories about the pain or about our body, if we can stay there with a sense of equanimity and just be with that pain for as long as we can tolerate it and explore it, we're, we're setting those neural pathways to do the same thing when someone pisses us off. So instead of having that reaction that would be the seed of hate, we can just be there with it. I want to say just very quickly, it's good to know when you need to change your posture in a practice. You know, I'm not saying to just like uh, torture yourself and, and be sit in pain the entire time, but just pause for a moment before you change your posture and see, can I be with this? What is the shape? What is the texture? How is the story unfolding in my mind? So that's equanimity from a mindfulness perspective. It's the same thing with attachments, like when we're feeling good in a practice uh, or the mind is feeling still and like, oh, this is great. You know, and like when all my practices to be like that, we start clinging on to it. What did I do before this practice that's making this one so good so I can repeat it again in the future? We've completely missed the whole point or we missed the, the opportunity to savor that experience. So I want you to, you know, the invitation here is to think about what's happening in your practice, difficult experiences that you have in your practice, sounds or pain in the body or thoughts that may arise as an opportunity to practice meeting things that we might normally push away. And so we build that strength to be with it rather than letting it kind of spiral. And then it's the same thing with our heart opening practices. So this equanimity of mind and heart when we're offering loving kindness, when we're offering compassion to all beings, what is it like to offer the stranger or the difficult person in a loving kindness practice, the same wish, the same aspiration for health, happiness, and freedom from suffering as, as it is our loved ones? Can we practice that even, that equal wish? It doesn't mean our relationships are equal. It doesn't mean that our expressions of love and care or our boundaries are um, the same. Those are definitely different. But the wish, the equanimous wish. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when we meet uh, in particular situations that are difficult with another person is that this is, again, the seed of hate. And so if we can be with that discomfort and maybe even wish this person that's bothering us or pissing us off either in the moment or later that night, uh, aspiration for them to be free from suffering, um, that we can find this kind of skillful response to cut that seed or it's another now, like uproot, uproot that seed so it doesn't grow into a sense of hatred. So it's the same solution. The, the antidote in the habit looping that I showed from a secular format is mindfulness and self-compassion. And the antidote in the Dharma to aversion is mindfulness and compassion. So the two wings of the bird that serve both, whether it's a secular explanation of it or a more um, Dharma explanation of it. It's the same, it's the same medicine of being with, being mindful, being with the experience, and then applying compassion either to ourselves or to another person. So just taking a moment to pause and let that sink in for a sec. What comes up? What questions do you have? What, what, what lands? What doesn't? What resonates? That's a good question. Yeah. David. yeah. Um, so I have a tendency to um, sort of stew or like, um, I don't know, you know, like wallow, I guess, and sort of like negativity, I guess. And I can like, a lot, like, if I'm not careful, like, <clears throat> The feelings will sort of like negative feelings will become a what I'm just sort of living in. You know what I mean? Like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to the point where I'm not able to really notice like good things that are happening anymore. But you know, I'm just I, the word wallow just keeps coming up. Like I'm wallowing sort of in depression or sadness, right? And so I, so there's like a fine line, I think for me anyway, between like 
sit like being okay with discomfort and sitting with uncomfortable feelings and then just like sitting like living with them you know what I mean and so can you like I guess I don't I can't picture like what um sitting with discomfort feels like as a what am I doing you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. from that standpoint like Mm -hmm. um because I feel like I could be just focused then like on um in the name like calling and like sitting with discomfort but really just sort of focusing on discomfort and not you know what I mean does that make sense yeah absolutely I want to ask before before we dive into that I want to ask in the very beginning you said if I'm not careful it can lead to this and what is that what does being careful look like for you well, that's interesting because I think what I'm calling being careful is actually more like avoidance. <laughs> and so mm. the, you know what I mean? Like I can, <clears throat> but it's, but it's almost like a, um, a helpful, it's not, um, yeah, it is like avoidance in the sense that I have to like um, purposefully, intentionally sort of like start focus on things that are good um which you know what I mean which is really a, a just a refocus but it's also that's the other danger is that I can also then just start to not pay any attention to the discomfort so I'm you know what I mean like yeah. actually that is true too so there's like the almost like a clinging to like discomfort or an aversion to discomfort. And for me, they can go to either one of those directions, like um, very far, you know, extreme um, ends of those, like of that spectrum. I don't know if that yeah. made sense, but. Yeah, yeah, so definitely, the, thank you. So the being careful is like, really actually just sort of like avoidance, I guess, <laughs> of the discomfort. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. The moment right before the avoidance driven coping kicks in, what happens right before that? I don't know if I can speak to like, um, like um, incidents, like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like a, a start and an end to something uncomfortable yeah. it's more like a state of being <clears throat> right right yep um so i don't know um yeah. can i offer a, a word and you can tell me if it fits or not mm-hmm. that you're noticing you're noticing something is that accurate when so like before, when before before you push it away and avoid it that you actually have, have to notice that something's there true so this is where you know we were describing in that um the habit looping is that there's the central nervous system the sympathetic nervous system kicking in and then there's an interpretation of the system of the situation which i think i'm hearing from you it's you're labeling that as wallowing is that correct mm-hmm. so yes you're... but that lasts for like i mean that can last for weeks right Right, yeah. right. So no, right, because then that's the looping, right? Yeah. So, so what I'm pointing to here is that before, um, you know, with that, I, the word, the the word choice that you used about if I'm not careful, mm-hmm. right before that, there is some sort of felt experience that you're having, mm-hmm. and what the invitation here is: can you stay there just for a few moments and explore it before? things start looping and just oh what is where am I feeling this in the body and then maybe you're like this is way too much I can't do it but you're just taking a little bite of it and noticing how it's feeling and then this is where we can uh, the the practices that we do before these moments like that kind of help set us up to meet them come in handy here so I can feel what's happening in my body I notice how my mind is responding and then when you said if I'm not careful, 
that that care that you apply to yourself instead of avoidance, it can be a more healthy coping mechanism, like talking to a friend or going for a walk or a therapist or a teacher or something like that. Um, so it's, I'm, I wanted to kind of, I'm doing this with my hands. It's kind of like <laughs> focus in on that exact moment where this perception of a problem arises as you're experiencing it in the body and the mind. And that's where we put the medicine, right? That's where we apply the medicine, the, the ointment of mindfulness and self-compassion. Like, and we're going to do this in a moment. Oh, it makes sense that I'm feeling this way. You know, uh, there are other people that feel this way. I'm not broken or wrong. Uh, and then this nurturing kind of, what do I need? You know, maybe it's a hand on your heart or a hand on the place in the body that you're feeling it. Uh, maybe it's offering phrases of self-compassion. May I accept that this is happening? May I accept myself? May I have the courage to deal with this? And then what do I need? What do I need now? You know, do I need water? Do I need a walk? Do I need to journal? Do I need to cry? Do I need to talk to a friend? This is just taking taking that that moment where there's like almost like a flashpoint where it becomes problematic and almost like it's like zooming in on your phone you know like just keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in and you can see oh there it is and then apply the medicine there now to talk a little bit more specifically about uh when it becomes too overwhelming whether it's in the physical or in the mind there's in the programs that I teach, we call it um, thresholds of experience or zones of experience. And so there's this kind of steady state where we're comfortable, things are feeling good. And then there's a little bit on either end of that where like, oh, this is getting a little bit too much or like, oh, I'm starting to disconnect, but you're still within that. You can still handle it. You know, it's what we call that the green zone, the zone that we can grow and learn, even if there is some discomfort. And then there's the times where it pushes us up into hyper arousal or hypo arousal, where we get extremely agitated and overwhelmed in our nervous system and in our mind or the opposite, where we just start disassociating, we start disconnecting and we push it away. And so in terms of um, practice, uh, that we just monitor where we are in those zones, like, oh, okay, this is workable. This pain is, I can, I can stay with it for a moment. I might need to move in a couple minutes, but right now I can be with it. Or the thought, you know, like, oh, here's this thought again. Okay, let me stay with it and see how it might lead to another thought. But then there's those times where we say, okay, this is too much. I need to move position or I need to shift my awareness to another uh, uh, object of, of mindfulness or something. And that's, that's skillful avoidance. You know, that's like healthy avoidance. Uh, so it's not to say that you need to stay with it, you know, and be really, sh you know, uh, uh, I can't think of the word. Um, disciplined like overly disciplined I like this word that they use in the Vipassana tradition of ardent determination so can I be with this and can I stay with it and then if not then I change you know so that's and I want to just be really clear that's in the practice what you're talk, what you might be referring to in certain terms of outside of the practice this kind of starts going in the realm of, ther of therapy you know and so I would say like I, I don't really want to comment too much on there but with that being said, I do firmly believe that our mindfulness and compassion practices can help us, not just in the meditations, but when we are having these experiences in life outside of it. Does that make you. sense? Yeah. Any... yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think I think something is a little more clear to me now. Thank you about um, uh, what it looks like to like sit with the experience. So in the graphic, like there's the, um, sorry everyone if I'm taking too much time, but um, like the activation of the nervous system and the interpretation that's happening, right? So sitting with, the sitting with it is the noticing of the, those things happening, which at some point are going to stop because they, it's like, it just stops. Like the reaction has an ending, right? 
so then that it would be the moment when if I'm not careful, I can go into like keep going into the bottom part of the graphic, right? Or I can right. just notice that now my body's not feeling that way anymore. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's like the ending of that's the, the line where it can be noticing can become like wallowing. Right. Right. Yeah. That's and so that flash point. Yeah. Okay. I had this reaction when when you said that you know when you named that like that it will it will end it will be over I had this reaction to start clapping because that's amazing right that's like that's where you know impermanence really serves us it's hard to practice impermanence when things are good it's really easy to practice an awareness of impermanence when things are tough like this will be over one way or another so you know i well done you know bowing to your practice that that led you to that insight because you did that yourself you know you got there on your own so that's that's really insightful um yeah yeah thanks for sharing that and you didn't take up too much time in fact this is this is the teaching you know teaching through inquiry and helping understand the experiences that we're having. So you're 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 teaching us right now. So thank you. Really beautiful. So why don't we practice a little bit of self-compassion to end our class? <clears throat> so perhaps closing the eyes, maybe lowering them down. Just taking a moment to Find an anchor right now. Maybe it's the breath. Maybe it's a sensation in the body. And this anchor is just a way of stabilizing ourselves. So if at any point during this practice we need it, we can return there. And let's return to this unpleasant experience that we were thinking about earlier whether it's something that's happening now or something that's happened in the past, just taking a moment to return to that experience. How it may be feeling in the body right now or how it was feeling during the time of that episode. And as we heard in that poem, Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and it will carry you to higher ground. So let's just allow this feeling to be here. Another word for allowing is accepting that this is what's happening right now or this is what happened in the past. taking a moment just to pause and call to mind that there are other beings out there in the world right now that are dealing with something similar, maybe different circumstances and situations, maybe different causes and conditions, but there are people out there now or in the past that have dealt with this in, the past, in their own way. You're not alone. You're not broken or weird. And then returning back to our experience, as we move into this offering of self-compassion for ourselves, it makes sense that we feel this way. It makes sense that our mind is interpreting the situation the way that it is. And some of us may feel helpful to place a hand on the heart or another area of the body that might feel comforting or stabilizing, just to let you know that you're here. Let yourself know that you're here. Offering this nurturing touch. And I'll offer some phrases that you may want to repeat silently in your mind, or perhaps just listen to the sentiments of these words as you hear them, but offering these aspirations as a gift to yourself. 
May I accept this moment exactly as it is. May I accept myself exactly as I am. May I have all the courage and compassion I need to meet this moment of difficulty. May I know that I am worthy. May I know that I'm deserving of self-compassion. May I be at ease as I navigate this challenge. May I be free from the suffering. And just resting for a moment, noticing what may be arising. Notice any shift that may have happened or in this practice. Before we end this moment of self-compassion, an invitation to set an intention. How would you like to meet difficult moments that arise in the future? Maybe a way of being or an attitude of meeting difficulty in the future to allow to be present with it, to hold it with a self, self-compassion, to be gentle. We come to an end of that practice, returning back to open eyes if they were closed. Any questions or comments on the self-compassion? I want very helpful, yeah, yeah. Um, one other thing that I, I also wanted to offer is that um, sometimes in this teaching, it might, I, I, I've said this before, it's like, oh, we have a magic wand and I'm just gonna like wish this away. <laughs> and that like in the moment of difficulty, things are happening really quickly. So while we talk about it as if it's very slowed down, it happens like the emotion arises like that. And so a lot of times it can be more supportive to work with something that's already happened than to try and apply these techniques to, I mean, it is helpful if we can, but it happens so fast in the moment that it might actually be um, more accessible to reflect on something that's happened in the past and that kind of like zooming, like, you know, the pinching, like zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, doing that with something that's already happened because things are happening so fast when our sympathetic nervous system gets triggered and there's hormones that are firing adrenaline and cortisol that it makes it really difficult to practice with it. Um, it's certainly um, doable, but sometimes in teachings like this, it might be more accessible to practice with something that's happened in the past. So I just wanted to say that because I don't want anyone to think like, oh, I should be acting this way when stress happens. We could be, but um, the practice really can be helpful more in reflecting um, retrospectively. Um, I have this writing, this passage from Jack Cornfield um, that's a little lengthy, but I want to read some key points from it because I think it kind of like summarizes a lot of this blending of the secu secular and the sacred. Um, so this is from um, a Vipassana teacher, Jack Cornfield. Aversion, anger, and hatred are states of mind that strike against experience, pushing it away, rejecting what is pre presented in the moment. They do not come from without. This insight is a reversal of the ordinary way we perceive life. We believe outer problems attack us. 
things are wrong and people misbehave, causing our anger and suffering to arise. But however painful our experiences may be, they are just painful experiences until we add the response of aversion or hatred. Only then does suffering arise. So again, it's not the thing that's triggering us, it's our response to it. If we react with anger, hatred, and aversion, these qualities become habitual. Like a distorted autoimmune response, our misguided reaction does not protect us. Rather, it becomes the cause of our continued unhappiness. The fact that aggression, anger, and aversion are built into our universal heritage is only the starting point in Buddhist psychology. After we learn how to face them directly, to see how they arise and function in our life, we can take a revolutionary step. Through the profound practice of mindfulness, through non-identification and compassion, we reach below the very synapses and cells and free ourselves from the grasp of these instinctive forces. With dedication, we discover it is possible to do so. And so that's the third noble truth. Change is possible. It's got chills. <laughs> So thank you all for being with me tonight. Let's end our time with a dedication. So just calling to mind the teachings and the practices that we've been engaged in tonight. Open choiceless awareness, broadening a spacious view of what's happening in our experience through practice. Learning about the secular formats on avoidance and the habit looping that comes from it, and the teachings from the Dharma on aversion and the seeds of hatred. Ending our evening tonight with those moments of self-compassion. And let's dedicate this energy that we've been cultivating through practicing and learning to the alleviation of suffering and not just our own, but of other beings. Maybe even this idea of being with our experience and finding healthy coping mechanisms will actually be in service, not just to our own well-being, but to all those around us. May we all uproot those seeds of hatred that we plant through aversion and avoidance. May we be steady on the path of mindfulness and compassion. If there's anyone else that you'd like to dedicate the energy of this evening towards. So thank you again for being with me here tonight and exploring this topic of aversion. If it feels comfortable to lower the head as a gesture of respect, not just to each other, but to our own enlightened minds.